Within hours of the Hamas attack on October 7th, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweeted his support for Israel. And on October 27th, India abstained from a U.N. vote on a ceasefire resolution that saw strong support from other nations in the global south. Although it has also returned and urged diplomacy, the Indian government has repeatedly voiced its support for Israel. But India and Israel have not always had such a close allyship. Its first generation of leaders were supportive of Palestinian rights and opposed to Zionism. India voted against the creation of Israel at the U.N., and it was the first non-Arab country to recognize the Palestinian Liberation Organization as the legitimate representative of Palestinians. India didn't establish formal ties with Israel until 1992, and no Indian leader had visited Israel until Modi did so in 2017. Given this history, it might seem odd to some that Modi has realigned his country's historical position so quickly. Close watchers of Indian politics, however, were less surprised. One of those people is professor and director of the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster. Natasha Cole joins us right now on Upfront. Natasha, thank you so much for joining me. It's easy to see parallels between uh, Prime Minister Modi and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, both lead right-wing nationalist religious governments. Uh, both have been accused of demonizing Muslims for political gain. But is it that simple? Is the fact that Modi and Netanyahu uh, share political views the reason why India and Israel are enjoying such warm ties now? Uh, thank you for having me on. I think that you're absolutely right in how uh, the current uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi, his support of Israel and his 2017 trip to is, uh, to Israel and, you know, what was at the time termed as a bromance uh, between uh, uh, Modi and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, what is, is an important reason why his supporters, and they are an important uh, element in contemporary Indian politics, the Hindutva or the political use of Hinduism, uh, his supporters see this as the position they should be espousing. However, this is a, a departure from conventional Indian uh, stance on Palestine and on the two-state solution. And uh, even in the aftermath of the Indian Prime Minister's remarks uh, uh, in October, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs issued then clarifications and statements saying that India's position on the issue on Israel-Palestine has not changed. So, so what we have here is a is a Modi-led BJP and Modi's own brand of politics uh, as playing a role as opposed to Indian policy having changed. At some point, even the Arab nations which have signed on to the Abraham Accords, nations that have attempted to quote-unquote normalize relations with Israel, they're still calling for a ceasefire. They're still calling for a much more moderate uh, position from Israel, and yet India seems to be far more lockstep, like the United States, uh, with Israel's actions at the moment. Do, does, does a moment like this show how contradictory some of those attempts are by the, by the Indian government? The external affairs ministry put out uh, statements and information concerning the supply of humanitarian aid, etc. They have, of course, because the government is the Modi-led BJP government, they have obviously stopped short of calling for a ceasefire and, in fact, not even taken a, a leadership role in any uh, in any uh, sense, in any meaningful sense of calling for of of attempting a mediation or anything like that. The Israel-Palestine issue in the Indian context has become extremely simplified. Uh, for the followers of the Hindutva project into something that is about religion and that is about the repression of Muslims by non-Muslims. This is simply for them about the fact that Muslims are a threat, Islamophobia as something that appeals to them because of how it has resonated with what we have seen in India, especially over the last uh, nine, now nearly 10 years. Let, 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 let's, let's, talk, let's talk about some of those uh, ideologies that are emerging from the BJP uh, and, and its allies. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about what's been happening online and in the media since October 7th. Allies of Modi's ruling party, the BJP, uh, have used the October 7th uh, horrific attacks uh, to whip up anti-Muslim sentiment inside of India. According to The Guardian, affiliated Facebook groups compared Hamas to militants in majority Muslim Kashmir and a prominent right-wing talk show host told viewers, quote, the same radical jihadist Islamic terrorist thinking that Israel is a victim of, we are a victim of as well. Israel is fighting this war on behalf of all of us. That kind of incitement, does that have a real world impact inside of India? 
that kind of incitement is sadly far too routine in India, even prior to October uh, this year. And that is that resonates with the public because there has been and because people the hindu is you know with the hindutva project people have been enrolled into an understanding that muslims are a threat and that islamophobia is a legitimate response to this threat so uh, and but but there are also other factors that that play a role uh, firstly the the role of fairly well uh, organized and systematic IT cells, information technology cells, that often spread uh, uh, misinformation uh, at the least and, and disinformation often, deliberately trying to get people to see a very selective understanding of, of anything that involves conflict and especially if it involves uh, minorities and Muslims. So there is the role of the information technology cells in that media ecosystem. There is also, I would argue, a, a, a kind of a thing that we've seen in recent years, which is attack on critical journalism and attack on fact checkers. In fact, all these right wing projects uh, portrays media and critical media as the enemy that stops people from understanding some some privileged idea of reality. It's it's the uh, it's the conspiracist kind of thinking that that thrives in right wing um, ecosystems, including in India. So the reason that that uh, people will have uh, you know, Hindutva adherents will often have a no holds barred. Uh, affirmation uh, view of Israel's actions is because it ties in with what they have been enrolled into understanding in line with the Hindutva project. But uh, sadly, it is also the, as I said, it is not just the fact that this is a, that views on Israel and Palestine have become something that divides the government from the Indian political opposition. It is also something that is seen as uh, in line with people's religious identities. We've seen a lot of crackdowns on protests inside of numerous Indian states. Uh, and what's interesting is it's not just the states that are under uh, BJP uh, control that's doing the crackdowns. Uh, now, there's no official policy that bans protests, but we've still seen demonstrators uh, arrested on multiple occasions. But why are the governments in these various states stifling support for Palestinians? I think that uh, the legacy of Hindu-Muslim riots in India is very significant. And, uh, and because there are a lot of conflict entrepreneurs that would use any, any such uh, real or perceived injury to any one particular community in order to whip up much greater violence, uh, the potential for that, uh, I think, has to be understood uh, against the background that we're uh, soon heading into the Indian general elections. So, so this is this is uh, so. My understanding would be that this is governments reacting to uh, their very specific instrumentalist interests at state level in the run up to elections, which would which would tie in with uh, you know with um, either worries about uh, riots or concerns about vote bank. Uh, so so I, I'm policy. thinking, for example, about Karnataka, where, uh, and by the way, it's governed by the main opposition Congress party, for those that don't know. Uh, police charged 10 activists with creating a public nuisance after they organized a silent march in support of Palestinians on October 16th in, in Bengaluru, the capital of the state. So in an example like that, based on what you're telling me, if they had organized a silent march in defense of Israel, for example... Would we have seen a similar response based on the instrumentalist concerns of the state? Uh, in, in, the, in the context of Karnataka, the BJP recently lost these elections, and that was after a lot of effort. And any non-BJP party in any state constantly runs the risk of being, if, if they allow certain kinds of political expression, runs the risk of being labeled either extremist or supporting extremism or supporting radicalization. So the uh, exigencies of domestic uh, inter-party politics uh, is what is what defines the, the, the worries that governments have in at state level, even if they are not BJP. Uh, remember that any position that is that is not in line with a very hyper nationalist one on issues that involve uh, minorities and specifically Muslims, such as on Kashmir, is seen as support of extremism or support of Islamic extremists, even worse 
things like terrorists. We're living in, in, a, in a context where uh, even critical media can, can be, or, or in intellectuals or university academics are targeted for views that would otherwise be perfectly acceptable in liberal democracy. So I think that creates a, a silence and, and um, censure around what it is that can be allowed without being politically labeled as an other. Uh, that's all the time we have for right now. Professor Call, I want to thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you.